So you're ready to want romp? Yeah. <laughs> good. yeah, so I do metaphysical romps, in case you didn't know that. Um, and I hear this is now interactive, even more, actually. So um, let's play, okay? So what's love got to do with it? And I thought I would explore the fundamentals of manifestation and demonstration because love is key to it. And uh, I'm doing Metaphysics 4 starting on November 7th, which um, is really all about practical application of our teachings, of unity teachings. And if you don't have one, two, and three, it's okay, I'll help you, all right? So feel free to come to that class. But I thought I'd give you like a teaser, and um, if you just go away with this information, it should be helpful. You good with that? All right, so we begin with the concept that life is consciousness. If it wasn't for your consciousness, you wouldn't know you're living a life, yes? And more and more, science is showing us that in a way, what we experience as life out here is really something we're making up inside. Because all we receive in our brain cell is electrical symbols and signals that we interpret. And then it's important we talk about what consciousness is. And it used to be we only talked about consciousness as being awareness. And now, in the last few years, science has added arousal too. So awareness is the state of being conscious of something. You're conscious of something right now, right? So you are really conscious in two directions, probably. You're conscious of what I'm doing up here. You're conscious of the slides. And you're conscious of any inner commentary that's going on. Yes? OK. And it, we also say it's the ability to directly know and perceive, to feel, or to be cognizant of events. So, so one of the most important things I learned in Unity at the very beginning is that we all participate in events. So this service is an event. And so everyone in this room is participating in this event, right? OK. Then the cool piece is, let's say there's 30 people in here. We're all participating in the same event, but we're probably having 30 different experiences. 30 different experiences. And that's an internal thing. That's because of your internal awareness. And why is this important? Well, it, it, it's important because while you may not have much control of what's going on out here, you have absolute control of what's going on in your consciousness. And that's our key concept in unity is that consciousness is everything. And then, what can be aware of? You're, we're aware of sensations. Some of you are cool. Anybody warm in here today? Yeah. <laughs> one, you see? Always one, thank you. <laughs> you're aware of the chair. You're aware of the sound. We're also aware of our beliefs, our ideas, our thoughts and images in our minds, feelings, emotions, experiences, attitudes. And we can even be observing our behaviors, yes? So behave. So then the other part is arousal. And arousal is the activation of the brain and body. It's a state of readiness so that we are prepared to engage in behaviors. You see, it's so great that science kind of caught up with what Unity had been teaching for years, that this arousal thing, you must have the ability to act or react or respond to what you're aware of, yes? Otherwise, you'd just be like a slug. And awareness leads to self-knowledge. Notice that's little s, self-knowledge. That's your personality. And higher self-knowledge. And I would hope that the reason why you're involved with unity or other spiritual traditions is because you want to get more knowledge about your higher self, right? So. So I hope that's your intention for being here and your intention for study. Because in a way, a lot of people on the spiritual path have kind of a 
intention deficit syndrome. That they don't have clarity about what their intention is. And intention is a driver in our lives. So we show up, but we really don't know why we're here. And if you don't know why you're here, well, then you will tend to not use whatever you're involved in in a way to raise your consciousness. You with me? So we got to do something about intention deficit syndrome. I'll tell you, I, I even set intentions when I'm meeting with a friend just for coffee. Because I want to be clear that I'm investing my time in a way that I get the most out of it. So, self-awareness leading to self-knowledge may lead to self-condemnation. In fact, when we're, when we're not awake and we're a little inept, we tend to go to self-condemnation. Have you noticed that? Our ego somehow has learned that if, if my ego beats myself up, that I'm going to change. It doesn't really work too well. So Charles Fillmore said this, we are constantly making conditions through our thoughts. Have you noticed that? You are making your conditions. I'm not talking about the outer conditions so much as I am the inner condition of your consciousness, your inner experience of what's going on. Okay? And then he says, we know the law, and in this quote, he never says what the law is. Not helpful. <laughs> not, not helpful, Charles. So, so the law here is, would be something like the law of mind action. So what's the law of mind actions? Thoughts held with feeling in your mind, thoughts held with feeling in your mind produce more thoughts with feelings of the same kind or similar, okay? So, so what is that saying? You've noticed this. We usually notice it more when we get angry about something. We have a seed thought feeling, we're hanging on to it, we're focusing, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger in our minds. Have you noticed that? Yeah, so it's like, like that seed thought begins to form kind of a colony in our mind, and it begins to take over. Yes? And so, if we know the law then, we can use it, and we can now use it consciously. Because if you didn't know the law, it was still operating, wasn't it? When you were a kid, or before you know the law, it doesn't matter, the law is the law. So he says, let, let us keep it. Well, we got to know what it is, and honestly, you cannot not keep it. Your choice is how you use it. What is the consciousness you're bringing to your thinking, feeling nature? Because that awareness of what you're bringing to your thinking, feeling nature will help you shift your thinking, feeling nature, and therefore your inner experience. So feel free to ask questions, all right? And then he says, judging from the plane of the personal leads into condemnation, and condemnation is always followed by the fixing of a penalty. That's, that's the beating ourselves up. And what I say is, if you're in self-condemnation and you're beating yourself up, now you have two things to work on. You have the original thought feeling you didn't want, and now all the garbage around beating yourself up. Wouldn't it be easier to go into self-acceptance? What, it, what would it be like if you were living and walking in a state of total self-acceptance and you became aware of error thinking, negative thinking, fear thinking, guilt thinking, and you simply noticed it? And it's in this vast sea of peace, of acceptance. And then I really believe we are more adept at shifting our consciousness. And self-acceptance is defined as the ability to love yourself unconditionally, no matter what flaws and traits we exist. What does love have to do with it? Loving yourself unconditionally so that you can grow more intentionally into the expression of the divinity you already are. So then when we look at our personality, our ego, 
What I love about Charles Fillmore is he really wasn't talking about killing off your ego as you hear in a lot of spiritual traditions. Like, it's all about your ego. Your ego's bad. Let's kill off our ego. Let's get rid of our ego. Well, you know, if you didn't have an ego, you'd be like a boneless chicken. You need your ego to go, to go through life. And so there are adverse aspects of the ego, and there are supportive aspects of the ego. And so when we become aware of this, we can use our supportive ego to raise or transform those adverse sides. I call my adverse ego my ugly twin. Did anybody have here have an ugly twin? That one shows up every once in a while. So the adverse ego is grounded in sense consciousness and causes trouble. So the ad, this adverse ego is more focused on what's coming in in the senses and evaluating and judging it than it is in remembering that it couldn't exist without our innate divinity. Because the weirdest thing is we're using our divine nature to manifest this negative thing. And we'll say that again. <laughs> we're using our divinity to manifest the negativity because our divinity doesn't care what we do with it. It's up to us to decide. You're the decider. And then it leads to gro this is Fillmore. It leads to groveling in the mire of materiality. <laughs> right? I almost feel like we ought to have ooh. Right? <laughs> oh, all right? Our supportive ego, that part of my personality where I'm more clearly connected with my divinity, is based on divine ideas used according to divine law. And when we are in that, we might soar in the heavens of our spirituality. I don't know about you, but I'm here to soar. Are you here to soar? Yeah. I am here to soar. Let's say that together. I am here to soar. Okay, so the ego is the I, and by reason of our divinity, oh, we makes and remakes. Hmm. We makes and we remakes. <laughs> yeah, I never passed English. Uh, we make and remake as we will. Are you noticing that? Because that's key, that you and I are always making and remaking ourselves moment to moment. And the weird thing is we make ourselves and then we make ourselves victims of what we make ourselves to be. Yeah? Okay? So what would it be like if you stepped in the power of your innate divinity, stepped into the power of the principles and laws, and use them in a way that now you're consciously, intentionally remaking yourself in the image of your divinity. What would that be like? I am divine, I make and remake as I will. Let's say that together. I am divine, I make and remake as I will. You see? Not only are we making and remaking our personalities, we're making and remaking our inner experiences, we're, we're making and remaking the, our bodies, we're making and remaking some of the events in our lives. If you really, really knew your magnificence, what would you make? What would you make? And then he go, Charles goes on to say, in this lie our greatest strength and our greatest weakness. In this lie my greatest strength and my greatest weakness. This making and remaking. Because in, the, in our weakness, we don't make up things very well. And in the awareness of our divinity, we do pretty well. So then... We have this pivotal consciousness, and I mentioned it in, in the meditation. And when we're primarily looking outward, 
in the sense of bringing in that raw data and processing it and forgetting that we're grounded in our divinity, we tend to make up things erroneously. When we could look inward, and looking inward is grounded in our practice of meditation because meditation builds a foundation in our unchanging divine nature. Your divinity doesn't change. It's utterly dependable, utterly dependable. And, and there's a, the three ways that I know of that science has shown that of effective meditation. Mantra, which is what I do. Mindfulness. How many people do mindfulness in the room? Yeah, mindfulness is very popular. And the loving kindness, that's a Buddhist tradition, yes? Loving kindness. And you can find all this stuff on the internet now if you don't have a practice. But what I say is, if you don't have a meditation, pra pra <laughs> a meditation practice, then maybe you're not as serious about your spiritual growth as you think. And I don't say that as a judgment. I say that as an opportunity to look at your life because it is meditation that forms the ground of our awareness of our beingness. And looking inward also includes prayer because prayer claims and puts a demand on divine ideas. Prayer claims and put a, puts a demand on our divinity. And in a unity type of prayer, which is affirmative prayer, it's not recommended that you sit and you make yourself small before a male god on a throne someplace else. Coral, Coral and Charles Fillmore said we should stand in our power. We should pray with vehemence, with vehemence. That is so contrary to all the ways in which I was taught to pray. And why do we pray? We pray because we have usually some sort of desire, right? And, and, and the shocking thing is, because we're always talking about prosperity, is the reason why most of us pray is because we're aware of some lack in our life. Lack of money, lack of relationships, lack of health. And because of that, we have a desire for something better. We have a desire to be better. We desire more abundance. We desire more health. And desire is key. It's also what love has to do with it. Because love is the driver of everything. Think about that. Don't we move from desire to desire? You desired to come here this morning. Maybe right now you desire to leave. I don't know. You know, you desire. It's, it's desire. And, and in unity, the, the, this principle of desire has a weird name. Love. Love is your ability to desire. And love is the ability we use to desire others. And then that's how we enter into loving another. You with me? We use the principle of love, which is desire, harmonizer, unifier, to be loving. So what's love got to do with it? Sincere desire is a form of prayer. Did you ever think about that? Sincere desire. And that desire should be a focused intention. And Charles said, it is the law of love that we have whatsoever we desire, whatsoever we desire. And he said, concentrated attention to the mind on an idea of any kind is equal to prayer. This makes available spiritual principles in proportion to the intensity and continuity of the mental effort and keeping your eye on the ball, so to speak. So demonstration and manifestation, we hardly ever think of it this way, are instantaneous in your consciousness. Do you ever think about that? We're, we're often thinking about demonstration and manifestation as what am I going to get out there? But as soon as you start that desire of prayer within you, there's an instantaneous effect in your consciousness. And that becomes part of the driver 
of an outward manifestation. And demonstration and manifestation depend on the law of expression. And the law of expression is from the abstract to the concrete, from the formless to the form. There's an irony here. We focus on our infinite potential, but you get nothing if you don't limit it in some way. And so everything moves from the ab abstract to the concrete with an inner experience in between, from the formless to the form, from the unlimited to the unlimited. And stumbling blocks happen, folks. They happen, and these are things we work with in consciousness. Some of you blocks at first may seem to be in the physical environment, but, but closer discernment reveals that they're primarily in the mind. Those stumbling blocks that seem to be outer, we're giving them power over us when they actually have no power over your consciousness. So you want to be aware of your thoughts and feelings and the words you say to yourself and to others. Because the truth is, you are divine. How are you using your divinity today? Let's say, I am divine. Together? I am divine. One more time. I am divine. And so you are, and so I am, and so it is.